let's see. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Chiari and Syringa Mayelia Foundation's educational lecture this evening. Um, I want to thank the Cleveland Clinic, and especially Dr. Mark Luciano, who has been fabulous in helping putting this all together. Uh, Marty from the Cleveland Clinic's been great. And Dr. Moran, who's our special guest this evening, thank you so much for being here. I have a lot of new faces in the audience, so I wanted to give you a little background about the Chiari and Syringomyelia Foundation. We're relatively a new organization in that we've only been around since 2007, the latter part of 2007, and yet we've made extremely huge strides in that time. And I attribute that to the fact that we have a wonderful board of directors who has vision, um, energy and a commitment to push the organization forward in its goals because they have either a family member who's affected, they themselves are affected, and that gives everyone on the board the passion to find the answers for everyone. Um, I commend the board also because when we started the organization we were looking at simply Chiari and Syringomyelia, and we came to the realization that that affects estimated 350,000 Americans. When you talk about related disorders, which will solve some of the pieces for what we need, now you're talking about millions of people. So we look for Chiari, Syringomyelia, and related disorders as our mission. Core values that we were built upon are tough. Um, we have to meet many standards in order to fulfill that. And the board has seen fit to go forward and um, not only within our internal structure make sure we adhere to these, but also through various rigorous organizations. So people will come in and say, how do you know it's a good charity? Is it legit? And there are ways to do this. You should look for any charity. Do they have the Guide Star Seal of Approval? In order to get the Guide Star Seal of Approval, you have to submit paperwork, you have to go through the IRS, you have to have your mission, you have to have a whole list of criteria in place before you'll get it. And they actually rate your charity and decide whether or not to give you a seal. The second thing I would tell you to look for is the Better Business Bureau. The Better Business Bureau, we're in the process, we're down to the final, we have two more steps. So I predict within, I'm going to say two weeks we're going to have this. Um, which is huge. There are 21 criteria that you must meet as an organization. If you meet those, that means you're transparent, that means you're fiscally responsible, that means you're sticking to your mission. And it requires a lot of time and effort on the charity's part to make sure we meet all of those standards, which we have. So that's important. And then the, the next thing I'll tell you about on the web is, how do you know the information that you're getting is good? We have a great board, which I'll tell you about in a little bit, a medical board that um, does all of our material. But there's a thing called health on the net. And health on the net means that you as an organization have to go back and you have to tell where did you get that information from? Did you just make it up? What publication did it come from? When did you put it on your site? Who's reviewing your material? So you know when you go to the Chiari and Syringomyelia Foundation's website, it's good, it's accurate, it's current. And that's important when you're looking for a disorder information. Here's our board of directors. And this group of fine, fine people, they range from attorneys to marketing specialists, business people. Um, their decisions directly impact where the foundation goes and what we do. And they're a really, really dedicated, hardworking group. This is the crown jewel of the organization. 
This board, called the Scientific Educational and Advisory Board, is truly, truly a world-class group of scientists, medical professionals from various disciplines. We have a veterinarian who works on animal models. We have um, engineers from Australia. We have neurosurgeons from across the United States. And they all come together and pool collaborative, collaboratively their findings so that they can make more sense out of the puzzle. So this board, and it goes on, and we even have a um, senior advisory panel because we never get rid of anyone. You are just moved up and um, continue to add your expertise into the group. And if you look at those names, I mean, they're really, really world-class recognized by their peers. So a fabulous group. Our fiscal responsibility is our board of trustees. And this is um, an interesting group as well because it's, first of all, it's international. And the second thing I want to point out, I guess, is that we have three of the major medical device companies who have joined our board of trustees, which means we must be doing something right for the medical device people to want to sit on our group. Um, and I think this group going forward, because they're bright, um, they're, they're business savvy, is going to move us into the 22nd century pretty quickly. So part of our mission is education, and how do we do that? We've established uh, nine educational chapters regionally around the United States. And every night we tape those lectures. So if you go to our website and you look under physician lectures, you'll see um, Seattle Children's Hospital, Cleveland Clinic, Duke University. You'll hear the experts talk about all kinds of topics from pain to genetics. Um, and you can go back and slow it down and hear everything. So if you can't fly to Seattle to hear something, you can access it on the web. And in fact, 78,000 people accessed our videos last year. So we have a small group here tonight, but think about that, 78,000 people are hearing what we have to say. Part of our campaign this year is the Consider Chiari campaign. And we're doing this in two ways. We have a layperson's poster, and we're taking this out to health fairs. Um, we had our medical experts come together and decide what are the seven most frequent symptoms, because there are a lot of different symptoms. But the medical people decided what those were not, not the layperson, and uh, reviewed all of this material before we put it out there. So this we're taking to health fairs. Then the other interesting thing is we're educating other physicians and health professionals through Grand Rounds. And we started this in Chicago at uh, Lutheran General, where we had a group of 60 medical professionals come in for their CME credits. We did a Grand Rounds lecture, and we kicked off the Consider Chiari campaign, which went over extremely well. And that lecture is also on the web if you want to see that, what we're doing to educate medical professionals. To do all of this, we need to raise money, and I'm just going to really briefly go through this. We have um, a series of events. This, this is a really interesting one, the Bobby Jones Classic. We just started this last year, and the Jones family, who's been very, very private forever, um, has graciously licensed the Bobby Jones name to us, and we are now allowed to say that he had syringomyelia. For the longest time, he wanted to be remembered for his golf, not for his disease. So to get the family, which it's seven grandchildren left, to sign off and um, put them on board and then host this classic down in Atlanta is huge. And this year, it's, it proves to be even bigger. Unite at Night, Kathy told you about. I hope you all get involved. Everybody walks. We do a charity ball in New York. Um, Every year, that, that's been, I've been doing that for 13 years. That actually funded the very first genetic study that was done at Duke, my first charity ball, and uh, was now picked up by the NIH, 
and moving forward. So um, that's, that shows you your dollars, your little dollars turn into big dollars and you can really get things done. Dinner dance for a cure. You're all here in Ohio. What are you doing Saturday night? Come on over, Dr. Luciana's gonna be there. I think it'll be a great event. If you're not doing anything, it's Twinsburg. Taste for a Cure, we do this fabulous, like 24 high-end wines with great food, like a cool jazz band, a lot of fun. We do that in Chicago every year. And this is kind of our like big, elegant event. It's a small dinner, it's 100 people. It's a classical opera. Um, a very elegant night. We're just sending out the invitations for this, but just to give you an idea, we have already raised a quarter of a million dollars for that dinner and the invitations have not gone out yet. So, what do we do with the money? We spend it on research and education. Um, if you look these are the things that we funded, and if you think about it, we've only been here since 2007. It's an interesting, interesting wide range of studies. It's not strictly Chiari, because there are subset populations and there are hydrodynamic issues. Um, I think the thing that I, that I find the, the uh, most interesting, honestly, is we're doing this hydrodynamics symposium which is coming up again and the last one we had was held in Zurich Switzerland we had 30 engineers and physicians and Dr. Luciano was there as well with uh, Hal Kate as the the main speakers um, that was looking at the hydrodynamics problem that will help hydrocephalus it will help Chiari it will help syringomyelia and when you think about all of those um, tentacles reaching out. What a wonderful thing when we start finding the answers for not only Chiarian Syngomyelia but hydrocephalus and other things as well. So I'm really proud of what we do and how we do it and I really do hope that all of you will take a moment, sign up on the web if you haven't already. Um, if you have any questions, you want to become more involved with the organization, please see Kathy, see me. Uh, we would love to have you, and we need more involvement on your part. And now I would like to introduce Kathy. You're going to introduce Dr. Luciano? I'm going to introduce Mark Luciano. All right, so Dr. Mark Luciano, I've been talking about him all night. Um, he brings the kind of energy to a group that I can't even express. When he walks in the room, everybody sits up. He, ha he has done more work in hydrocephalus CSF. He's a clinician, he's a researcher, he's a scientist, and he's a great human being, which means more to me than anything. So Dr. Luciano, if you would please come up and take over. Thank you so much. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to recognize uh, Dorothy Poppy and, and, and Kathy Posnick for the really fabulous job they do. I think we're really lucky to be here in Cleveland uh, for lots of reasons, but a reason tonight is that we are one of the nine uh, uh, groups, local support groups in the country, and that uh, people like this can arrange meetings and make this all possible. Kathy Posnick does a local job, a wonderful job here locally, but also functions on the national level. Uh, and this. This group works on both levels. They have good functions, actually fun functions right here, and educational functions right here in this region. Uh, but they also are connected to very important efforts, as you heard from Dorothy, in terms of research support and education support. So I think we are really lucky to, to have uh, very devoted, passionate people like this uh, putting this together. You know, many diseases in the past uh, start off with, with as little known about them. And it's the people who experience it, the families, that really uh, play a major role in pushing uh, more effort, more scientific effort, and more support for, for patients that go through this. And really uh, uh, teach us a lot about how to advance uh, treatment in this disorder, in, in, in any disorder. So uh, it is really important uh, to get uh, support and education amongst ourselves and support uh, our research 
and, uh, and each other. So I'm not here for that. I'm here just simply to introduce uh, a, a wonderful clinician uh, and geneticist and, and friend, uh, Rocia Moran, Dr. S Dr. Moran, who is a Ohio-trained gem from the Ohio State uh, University and from Case Western uh, and from Rainbow uh, Babies. She's uh, trained in pediatrics and genetics. She is head of pediatric genetics here at the Cleveland Clinic and she's the medical director of the general genetics uh, clinics. Uh, she has a specialty interest as well in connective tissue disorders uh, and is here to talk to us uh, generally about genetics. We can all use a, a, a lesson in, in genetics and how it relates uh, to connective disorders and Chiari malformation. Uh, please help me welcome uh, Dr. Moran. Thanks. All right, so I've been told to keep it around 30 minutes so that there will be plenty of time for questions. And I really think that with groups like these that are relatively small, the question and answer part is always the most interesting for you guys and the most beneficial. So I will try to go through the slides as best I can in the allotted time, but I have a lot of information to cover. And it really um, highlights, these types of organizations really highlight what's so important to me, and that's the educational component of what these foundations provide. So much anymore, medical information is really quickly evolving, and so much onus is on the patient to really empower themselves with knowledge. So any chance I get to speak to groups like this and educate them about what I do and what genetics means to their particular disorder, I really jump at that opportunity because this is really a time to understand what's going in genetics. It's an extremely exciting time. It's an extremely complicated time. And some of the concepts I'll go over, by the time you leave here, you'll probably know more than the average physician about these types of genetic concepts and how they relate to Chiari and Syringomyelia. And I use those interchangeably. I'm going to focus on Chiari, but I'll use those uh, terms interchangeably throughout my talk. So we'll get started just by, I always go have an overview of what I'm going to talk about because I think it kind of helps you focus on what the scope of my talk is. I don't want it to be too scientific. I really want an opportunity for question and answer, but just to give you a framework of what I'm going to be talking about. And I think the most important thing you walk away with today is to understand what genetics is, because it's so complex, and I think it will become such an important part of disease in general. Even if the genetics right now of this disorder are not well understood, it will be understood with time. And empowering yourselves with these concepts now will help you later when that information is finally teased out. So to review our current understanding and to appreciate the complexities, I think a lot of press has been given to what we're doing in research, what we're doing in genetics, but the appreciation of the complexity I don't think has been accurately um, revealed. So I, I hope to provide you with some information about how complex it really is and the challenges that we're faced as clinicians and researchers when we're dealing with complex disorders like this. So I know Dr. Luciano gave you a little bit of background about myself, but I think whenever anyone's giving a talk to an audience, I always like to tell you where I am coming from. So if I stand here as a surgeon, I have a very different approach to a patient with this diagnosis. As a neurologist, I would have a different approach. So I want to give you what my approach is as a medical geneticist. Like Dr. Luciano said, I have my primary training in pediatrics, and I think that's important because a lot of these disorders are developmental, and I'll go into why I believe that's so. Um, I did a fellowship in medical genetics at Rainbow Babies and Children's, and I have a special interest in connective tissue disorders, so disorders that affect kind of the matrix of what's holding, holding us together. And that does overlap with patients with Chiari, as I'll get into in a little bit. And my research is how to apply new technology to identify new genes associated with these disorders in order to identify patients earlier and treat them better. So I am very lucky to practice at the Cleveland Clinic, and I have an amazing genetics team that I work with. Um, I'm the medical director of the non-cancer genetics clinics, which is pretty much everything but cancer. Um, and we have our home in the Learner Research Institute, which is a fantastic opportunity to really take bench research to the bedside, and that's what we call translational research. So it really gives us the opportunity to work with, with primary um, scientists to work on these disorders and, and bring them to the patient bedside much quicker than in other settings. 
I work with a team of 12 genetic counselors who oftentimes see patients for genetic counseling to help educate them on these disorders about heritability and about testing and their limitations. And I am fortunate enough to closely collaborate with um, pretty much any physician at the Cleveland Clinic throughout the health system in every subspecialty. It's really such an ingrained part of what we do in genetics to really work with the surgeons, to work with the neurologists, to work with everyone as part of a team to really provide the best comprehensive pa uh, care for our patients. Um, to give you a background, you know, with, with the evolving knowledge of genetics and, and the technologies that are available to us, you know, genetics used to be the study of rare disorders. And one of my favorite quotes is by really the founder of medical genetics, Dr. Victor McCusick, who said that genetics was once a branch of medicine and now medicine is a branch of genetics. And I think it's important while there are some... Um, individuals who think that, you know, Chiari may not be genetic. I think it's important to note that genetics really touches just about every state of human life, whether it's in health or disease. We haven't teased out how that interaction works and how that it plays out in a person's genetic home, in their environment. But it's really hard to argue that genetics doesn't touch every state of human health. And I think that's an important thing to remember. And so while we work through the genetics of these you know, rare disorders or complex disorders, we will find a genetic component that somehow um, causes or affects the expression of that disease. So one thing that I like to do is to kind of reflect back on popular press. So whenever ever I give talks to lay audiences, first of all, I don't consider you guys in these types of foundations lay audiences because you often know a lot more than most providers do about a particular disorder, so you're a very educated audience. But to kind of see what the popular press has done with genetics over time. And I chose Time Magazine as kind of a one magazine to kind of focus on to see what's been out there and put out there about genetics. So this was a, a, a magazine cover that occurred, and I'll get into the dates later, but the new genetics man into superhuman. And I think it provides just an example of kind of the false expectations that the study of genetics kind of had even from an early time. That went into tinkering with life. You know, we always get concerned about, you know, human engineering, but tinkering with life was another one that came up. Solving the mysteries of heredity with, you know, multiple cloned babies. Cloning humans, which came out around the time that Dolly was cloned, and the concerns and ethics regarding that. Um, the future is now of genetics. And again, I'll get into the dates in a minute. Cracking the code. With, this is a picture of, um, of Dr. Um, Ventner and uh, Francis Collins as they race to sequence the human genome. Um, going back again to the original Time magazine about solving the mysteries of DNA. And then finally with why your DNA now is not your destiny. So I found it interesting to go back and kind of look at what do these dates reflect. So the new genetics, anybody want to oh, guess what time? 1971, that was the new genetics. I wasn't even born then. So you can guess how old I am. Tinkering with life, anyone want to guess what time frame that was? 1977, we're not tinkering with life. I'll clue you in there. Solving the mysteries of heredity. We haven't solved them, and that was from 1989. Cloning humans, we're currently not doing that. That was 1993. I was in the first year of college at that time. Genetics, the future is now, 1994. I was in my second year as a molecular genetics um, student. Cracking the code, that occurred in the year 2000. That was a very exciting and is an exciting time, and I'll talk about why that was important. Solving the mysteries of DNA, three years later, we haven't solved them. And then why DNA isn't the complete answer, and that's 2010. So we have a long way to go. So you have to be careful about what you read and what's put out there in the press. We are getting there. It's important that we get there, but we're not quite there yet. So the next part of my talk, I want to talk about some basic concepts. So hopefully I can keep people awake. It's dinner time, it's warm in here, but some basic concepts about genetics so that you understand. So DNA is really our instruction manual that tells our bodies how to grow and develop. It's like looking at your DNA as if it were an encyclopedia on the shelf, where the encyclopedia volumes are housed on chromosomes, and the individual genes are chapters in that particular volume. And we get 23 pairs of our chromosomes, one from our mom, one from our dad. Um, and the sex-determining chromosomes are the, are the X chromosomes, XX or XY. 
And this is kind of a, a pictorial representation of how the letters are together in the double helix. That gets wound up tightly and coiled into a chromosome so that the material can split. Genes are made up of letters, as you can see in that double helix at the bottom. I don't know if I have a pointer. I think it's down here. They're made up of specific letters that serve a specific function. There are three billion letters in our genetic code and billions of cells within our body. And there are 25,000 to 30,000 unique spelling in each individual. It's a lot of spelling differences. And these letters are, are read in sets of three in order to make protein. And, and they're, they're made in amino acids which make up protein. So how does this happen in, in the context of disease? So if you can think about all the letters that need to be spelled correctly over and over and over again, when a new human being is made, there's a lot of opportunity for mistakes. And there's also a lot of opportunities that those mistakes may not necessarily mean that much. So there's a lot of information in our genetic code that we can spell out, but we aren't quite sure what that means in the context of a person, in a particular environment, and in the context of other genes that that person might have. So when we think about diseases and disorders, we think about inheritance. How are they inherited? How is it? I'm a why person. I want to know why did this happen? Because get to me, getting down to fundamental question of why this happened helps direct the treatment and potentially a cure. So one way we get an abnormality is by having a single misspelling or mutation or deletion of one gene. Well, we get two copies of all our genes. So the other copy may not matter or it does. In the case of autosomal dominant inheritance, it matters. So you need to have two functioning genes in order to express disease. And we see that in every generation. One person has it. The next, the next generation is at 50-50 risk, and the next generation is at 50-50 risk. Autosomal means it's non-gender um, non determining. So males and females are equally affected. Recessive inheritance means you need two non-functioning copies. And this is where we see a lot in genetics clinic people come in and say, well, there's nothing, this isn't in my family, how could this have happened? Well, it's because you need two non-functioning copies. So your parents have one, you got two, so we don't see it in families. So just because you don't have it in your family doesn't mean it's not genetic. It just means that it might have been inherited differently or it might have been unique to, the, to you or to the person that has the disorder. X-linked means that it's boys are more commonly affected. It doesn't mean women aren't commonly affected. It just means boys are more likely to have severe disease. And then I won't, I'll touch on, I'll just say mitochondrial, but I won't go there, but that's a very different can of worms and a very different inheritance where a woman has the problem and all her children were in hell at that problem. I think these were out of order. So. How do we figure out these misspellings? How do we find these problems in our DNA? Technology has advanced so significantly just in the time that I've practiced medicine that we have the ability now to sequence every letter of our genetic code. And this is an example of how easy it is to, to read the genetic code. And I, and I say that facetiously because it's not. There are billions of letters that are generated from a sequence. And that's a lot of letters to tease out. The problem is, we don't know how to interpret it. So we can identify the spellings, we can identify the spelling errors, but we don't know what it means. And I kind of, my analogy is, it's like taking a college course and buying your textbooks in Chinese. We don't really have that manual to help guide us through what these misspellings mean. So we have a long way to go. The additional challenge that we have in genetics is that you know, you remember biology and learning about Mendel's peas and this autosomal dominant inheritance and recessive inheritance. The reality is it isn't always that simple. And there are disorders that are autosomal dominant, meaning that the gene gets passed on 50-50 with each generation, but it may not be expressed. It may be expressed differently in a particular individual. So it makes it extremely hard to understand what a specific misspelling in a person is when we can't even find it. So that has led us down trying to emphasize the study of the human genome. So not just studying individual genes, but studying people, multiple genes, and their families. And it's kind of like looking for a needle in a haystack, because you're not really sure where you're looking. You know there's a lot of haystack and a lot of straw, but you're not sure if you're going to find the needle. 
So I'll touch quickly on genetics and genomics, um, because just for the sake of time, because you'll hear that interchangeably, particularly with complex disorders like Chiari. So the genetics is traditionally the study of single genes and that gene behavior in the context of a cell or an organism. So again, rare disorders, disorders that are, are pretty straightforward, most people don't have, most people won't have. Genomics is the study of all the genes and the environment and how that relates to disease. So my analogy for that is that genomics is like a garden. Genetics is a single plant within that garden, and genomics is the study of soil, it's the study of temperature, water, it's the study of the environment around that single plant. So how does that apply to Chiari malformations and syringomyelia? Well, the first question I think you should ask is, is it genetic? I think that's what everybody asks. And I think there's a still a lot of debate as to whatever, whether or not it's genetic. And I think, again, going back to my original statement is, Everything is genetic. So Chiari malformations used to be considered a sporadic condition, meaning that it was not inherited without a genome cause. It's important to note that sporadic doesn't mean it's not genetic. Sporadic just means it wasn't an inherited thing from a particular parent. But there is emerging evidence as we're studying the genomes of individuals with Chiari's and family history that there is indeed a genetic component. And so what is that evidence? So if you look at animal models and you look at the early basic science research that's being done, there is a suggestion that there are defects in, in the embryonic, so that's an example of, a, of an early embryo, and the cells that are involved in the formation of the posterior fossa. So that's the first line of evidence, and that abnormal cell migration can be responsible for the shape of that posterior fossa. The other important part of this is the study of families, and families with family history of multiple individuals with Chiari are very important to this work. And there are, are researchers that have linked this to chromosomes 9 and 15, so they've done those fancy single nucleotide changes looking for common areas that these people have in their genomes. So there's early studies that are suggesting, yes, there is a genetic link here. Identical twins, so twins that are genetically the same, they're not 100% the same, but they're, for the most part, genetically the same. If you identify Chiari in one sibling, you will find it very commonly in the other. And then there's the association of Chiari with genetic syndromes. There's about 35 syndromes that have been reported to have Chiari. A lot of them have to do with abnormalities of that posterior fossa. And that becomes important because that helps us kind of hone in on those genes that are important in normal posterior fossa formation. I want to touch base on the association of Chiari and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome because that's something that's near and dear to me. I see a lot of patients for evaluation of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. I think it's important to note that there are eight different, very genetically and clinically different types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Many are easy to rule out by a simple physical examination. Genetic testing exists for some, but not all. The most common diagnosis I see in my clinic is the hypermobile type of EDS, or type 3 EDS, but there's really no clear-cut association with a particular type of EDS. But I think it's important to note, so patients with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, if you don't already know, present with skeletal problems, joint hypermobility, and signs that there's a connective tissue abnormality. And if you think about the bones in the, in the skull, and the tissue that we have, a lot of that is made up of connective tissue. So the association makes sense. The problem is, is that not everybody with Chiari is the same. You look around this room, and I think you would all agree that many of you have some common medical problems and then very different medical problems. So it's, you really can't look at Chiari as a single gene cause, but a very different cause depending on that particular person. And that's where it's really important to characterize individual patients with Chiari so that it can help research identify locations in the genome to look at, and I'll get into that in a little bit. So how does this help us, and how does this help you? Well, knowing that there is, could be a, con a genetic cause allows us to study, in this case, syndromes that are involved in Chiari and hone in on those particular syndromes and looking at those genes and how they might help the general public. So while some of these syndromes are rare, you know, the genes involved and, and abnormalities in those genes may not be as rare as we thought. Studying families can help us locate regions of interest so that we can identify patients who might be at risk. 
And understanding the underlying genetic cause can help us identify other at-risk patients better and their family members and potentially help direct their treatment. So where are we now? Well, like I've been saying, no single gene has been identified that is responsible for Chiari malformation. And it's likely that's because Chiari malformations are probably a genomic disorder, meaning that it might have a genetic component, but it's also other genes that might be involved. It might be the environment that that gene is expressed. And it's likely that there may not be just one single gene cause, but multiple gene causes. Makes it, make, that makes it really hard for scientists and physicians to pinpoint and find these causes because not two people with, with carry malformations are alike. It's also important to note that genetics is not everything. I'd like to think it's extremely important for job security, but it's not everything. You know, and not knowing the genetic cause doesn't necessarily not help you. Um, it's just one piece of the puzzle. Um, and it may not be the only contributing factor, and it may not be the magical answer we're seeking right now. So what do you need to know? So, do you need to go out and sequence your whole genome? It actually only costs $7,000. And to give you an idea, in, 2000, in the year 2000, it cost $300 million. So the price has come way down. So do you need to do that? I would argue no, because we can sequence your genome. We just don't know how to interpret it. Should you participate in research? I think that's a very individual decision to make. Um, I think it's participation in research that helps move our knowledge forward, but it's a very personal decision to be made. Um, I'm sure any of your doctors could talk to you about whether or not research would be a, a good option for you. Should you screen all your family members with disease if you're identified? I think most neurologists and neurosurgeons would argue no. Should you become a geneticist? I think the answer is yes. I think we need more geneticists in this field, and I think having advocates for Chiari would be a wonderful addition. But what important tool that you, do you have that you could empower yourself and your family if you have Chiari or at risk? And the answer to that is your family history. So for complex diseases like Chiari, the most valuable tool to predict future health and disease is your family history. That doesn't mean that you will have a family history of Chiari, but if you do have a family history of Chiari and you yourself are not affected, it's an important conversation to have with your physician to alert them that this disorder has been identified in your family. And that allows your physician to pay a little bit more closer attention to any symptoms that you might have. Doesn't mean that you should go out and get an MRI, but it do, or your children should go out and get an MRI, but it should allow your physicians to pay attention to the symptoms that might be associated so that if there are symptoms present, it might give them a little bit more of a pause as to whether or not they might need an MRI. And so what about the other related disorders, particularly the syndromes? Like I said before, I think it's easy to tease out some of these rare skeletal disorders. Um, EDS is something that should be considered. Um, I know there was a question about association with fibromyalgia, and I think it's important to understand that there have been some early association with these disorders, but to really find a physician, if you have symptoms of one of these disorders, find a physician who is um, knowledgeable about the disorder and knows how to evaluate it to make sure that you are properly identified. The problem with being improperly identified is it could prevent you from getting the treatment that you need. And I've actually seen families who were told that they couldn't have decompression surgery because they had a diagnosis of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and that diagnosis was not correct. So I think it's important to make sure that you get the appropriate diagnosis from a physician who's familiar with these disorders so it doesn't interfere with your treatment. And where can you find more information, particularly about research? Again, I think foundations like CSF are amazing, and I think they provide a wonderful opportunity for education and information. Um, so I really encourage you to, to go on the website and find information. The other piece that I always provide families with, that have rare disorders are organizations like clinicaltrials.gov, which is an NIH-sponsored website that actually lists based on whatever query you make. So in this case, if you query Chiari malformations, I believe there's 
at least five studies that are ongoing um, that are actively recruiting participants, whether they're looking at differences in intervention, whether they're looking at the genetics of Chiari, and it gives you a contact as to who you could contact to see if you would qualify for participation in their studies. And this gets updated regularly, so as, as researchers get funded, this is an ongoing thing. So I usually tell families to check at least once a year to see if there are any new updates if you're interested in pursuing a research route. So what I hope you take away with and what I hope I haven't confused you with is that gen the genetics of Chiari is complex. It's a complex disorder, which means the genetics is going to be complex. But knowledge of the genetic causes is only one piece of the puzzle. And I think that's the hope and promise of personalized medicine is that genetics can be put into your care as a component of your care so that family history and the genetics is one piece of it, but it's not everything. But it is an important piece and really what the pr underlying the promise of personalized health care. So you're not treated as a number, but you're treated as an individual. Studies are still ongoing to solve the mystery of, of why Chiari occurs and why it occurs within families, why it doesn't occur within families, and why it's so variable even among individuals. Again, no two Chiari patients are alike. I've never met a patient who was the same. Um, family history plays an important role in disease risk, so just alerting your physicians if there's a diagnosis in the family, particularly if you have children that you're worried about. And I think just understanding that the advances in technology and research are moving forward. It's participation in research that helps us identify um, the genetic causes and hopefully will help us find a, a cure, a prevention, and a better treatment. And I can take any questions.
I will, I will repeat the question. Yes. I was just, oh, I was just saying that that's my background. Is I'm a train. I have training in pediatrics, which the training in pediatrics focuses a lot on basically embryologic development, which I think is an important piece of understanding the underlying problem in these disorders. Because as Dr. Luciano said, they're congenital, so you're born with it. So for me, it was an added benefit to have that training because, as a pediatrician, we're trained in embryology. Well, I think that's the challenge, and certainly, you know, having a family history is an important piece of it. Um, a good neurologic assessment is also very important. Um, a good neurologist can localize findings to a particular part of the brain that would then prompt an MRI. So I think all of those are important pieces. So a good physical exam and a good neurologic exam um, is what I would base the recommendation on. I think most neurologists would not MRI an asymptomatic or a child that does not have symptoms of a Chiari. Um, it's just it's not recommended because the chances of finding it are very small, but a good neurologic exam is very important if there's a concern for a Chiari. Can you talk about PBS a little bit? My daughter's talked about PBS also. In your clinical practice here at Kluge Clinic, do you see a lot of pediatrics or both Chiari and so I see about 500 EDS patients a year. Of those, the minority have a Chiari. Um, I would say less than 1%. So it's a population that I see more from a um, aortic disease standpoint. So my experience has not supported that there's a direct link. But again, these are rare disorders, so I may not have seen enough to really make that link, or I'm just not seeing the right patients. So it's really hard to say right now. I think EDS, particularly the hypermobile type, is a huge challenge. So assessing hypermobility, particularly in children, because children are more flexible than adults and girls are more flexible than boys, um, and there's really no good objective measure of hypermobility outside of the Baton scale, which in my experience is frequently done wrong. So you really have to pay attention to the physical exam findings if you really want to diagnose someone with EDS. Um, there's no test. There's one gene that's been associated with it, but it really hasn't proven out to be a reliable test to use to predict disease. Um, so it's really a clinical assessment. And the diagnosis, particularly of hypermobile EDS, is a clinical one, and it doesn't help. It means you're flexible. It's a descriptor. So I really, I really, I'm really careful about handing out that diagnosis as either associated with Chiari or independent of a Chiari. Has uh, cataplexy been uh, associated with the Chiaris? Uh, you know, you, you, we do hear about uh, sort of drop attacks uh, with Chiari. And uh, certainly I, th I think that, there, that this can happen in rare cases particularly when, when there is considerable tightness uh, uh, at, the, at the junction, because uh, there may even be some vascular compromise, at least in some positions of that. So it, it is possible, and it's been rarely described, but it is far from a, from a typical, typical presentation. So, yes? If you have a surgery, you have more surgery? Uh, the, uh, there is a possibility of uh, recurrence through either scar or they're required to decompress further. Uh, our reoperation re rate here at the clinic is, is about five, six percent. So it's not, it's not very frequent, but it can happen. I'd like to ask uh, if you've had your entire sequence performed. It's just $7,000 now if it comes down to five. So, so the answer to that is no, but what I have participated in to have the experience. So there's a lot of direct to consumer genetic testing that's available through companies that advertise you can spit in a cup and for $100 identify what your risk for diseases are. So I did that 
to understand what the output was so I could counsel my families. My favorite call was from one of my favorite neurologists who, called, who did this himself and said, I don't understand these results. It says I'm at low risk for, this particular person had Crohn's disease and um, I think it was diabetes. He says, it says I'm low risk, but I have both of these disorders. So you have to be very careful because again, the technology exists to identify misspellings in the DNA, but whether or not those misspellings relate to disease is really in its infancy. So the interpretation is far from ready for prime time. So I think you have to be careful. Um, if you do this type of sequencing under a research basis, that's a completely different um, participation. You know, it, there's usually no cost to you. And what they're looking for is areas of the DNA that you might share in common with another person with the same symptoms. So they're really carefully clinically evaluating you and then looking at your DNA to see how those changes might be in common with someone else with similar symptoms, not different symptoms, not an EDS or with, with Chiari or a fibromyalgia with Chiari, but patients with similar symptoms. What type of genetic differences do they share in common that could point to a susceptibility gene? So you have to be careful because right now we just can't interpret the meaning of these misspellings and you, you just have to be careful to not get misdiagnosed. I think that goes back to my original statement that in the ab a good neurologic exam and in the absence of symptoms, we don't recommend uh, screening. But knowing that there could be a stronger genetic component in your family, I mean, a research study would be, you know, for your participation would be great because it's uncommon to see multiple affected family members. Um, so again, going back to a good physical exam and asking these important questions, even if they're 100, but having someone go through and make sure those symptoms aren't present in a particular person. I think that's the best predictor of the presence or absence of a Chiari. Well, I, I have to say that we, we probably can't know the answer to that with certainty because uh, it is a matter of detection. We certainly know with the greater and greater use of the MRI uh, imaging, uh, we are detecting Chiari more and more in asymptomatic patients. So I think there's no question that uh, it is uh, being diagnosed more than it was uh, some years ago. And the more we use MRIs uh, for any, anything from head injury to, to, to other disorders, we, we do find, uh, incidentally found Chiari malformation. So this has also changed how we look at Chiari a great deal because uh, we now know that some people can have quite impressive Chiari malformations and be totally asymptomatic. So that's changed uh, how, we, how we look in, in our criteria for surgery. Uh, I, so I don't think that, uh, I don't know if you have any comments about changing uh, uh, genetic background. And I think that all goes back to other, you can make comparisons with other complex disorders where the genetic cause isn't known, like autism. So our awareness is increasing, our identification is better. I don't know that there is an environmental component. I, I, I think it's too soon to tell. And again, it's just so hard to tease out what's environment, what's genetic, because it's so complex. Certainly once we start to look at genes that might confer a susceptibility, it might make it easier, but right now we just, it's again, it's looking for that needle in the haystack stack and then trying to understand how that needle functions within the context of that haystack. You know, uh, Chiari generally we believe does not change very much, but we often do get MRIs at different time points. Uh, because uh, there can be small changes over time, and uh, different different studies 
with slightly different techniques and angles of the head, sometimes reveal things differently. We also repeat studies sometimes to get different kinds of sequences. There's the, what we call the Cine flow study, which evaluates the motion of the fluid. And sometimes we repeat a study to get that. Uh, the MRI uh, is not something that needs to repeat, be repeated on a yearly basis to look for progress. Uh, that's for Chiari. The, the answer for syrinx is slightly different. Because if you have a Chiari which is causing a syrinx, and syrinx, I'm sure you all know, is accumulation of fluid in the spinal cord, that we do watch on a regular basis, as sometimes as frequently as every six months or every year, because there can be uh, growth of a syrinx and change in, sphere, in, in, in the syrinx. On occasion, I've seen a decrease in the size of a syrinx, but generally it's stable, and we're, of course, concerned and watching for an increase in the size of the syrinx. So regularly when there's a syrinx, and probably just one or two studies, and then follow the patient clinically uh, for, for the duration of the time. So if someone has symptomatic hearing um, in their 30s, and they have a A syrinx? Yes, that's possible. Um, and, and often by following the patients clinically over time, you can, you can also rule that. Even, even in that situation, we don't get an MRI every year uh, onward. Uh, Would the symptoms get worse if the syrinx is developed? Yeah, uh, the syrinx has a different set of symptoms, uh, changes in numbness or, or strength in your arms or tingling and so forth that we can often detect through, through a good neurological exam. So we watch for those things. Yes. Oh, I've had this evidence for the last 25 years, and I did the neurologist, and I had had MRIs on my brain, and they say I have MS, but I've only got like a couple spots on my brain. But now my daughter has found out she has that. Is it a possibility? Do I need to get checked for that, or does the MRI brain scan for the MS detected? Or? Oh, so your your daughter has MS, or? And the syringal myelia as well. So you're asking if you need to be, if you need repeated tests for MS? Do I need the have a different kind of MRI to see if I have the Chiari? The Chiari. Uh, no, the, the standard MRI, MRI does detect a Chiari malformation, so that, that would be the same. Yes? The, from the from the syrinx in, in the spinal cord? Well, you know, actually historically, and, and I always hear the story from one of the neurologists, uh, the pediatric neurologist that, uh, that works here at the clinic, that they did participate in many years ago in, in x-ray guided needle aspiration. They would take the fluid out acutely. Uh, it's very dangerous to do it, especially in a closed procedure that way with that kind of guidance to take out that fluid. The spinal cord is extremely delicate. Uh, and you can injure the spinal cord or a blood vessel that's going to the spinal cord. But the, the quicker answer to that is it's not very useful anyway because the fluid would just reaccumulate. The only way to treat a syrinx is by getting at the cause or by uh, draining it uh, in an open fashion and with a, a stent that will keep it open. Uh, we try and get at the cause because although it's not completely understood, uh, it's generally believed that the cause of the accum accumulation of fluid inside the spinal cord is a blockage of fluid flow on the outside of the spinal cord. Chiari is one of those blockages. So if we open up the, the Chiari and allow good fluid flow between the head and the neck, then most of the time, roughly 80% of the time, we are treating the syrinx. And the syrinx, if, if it doesn't disappear, it, it at least relaxes. So that's the way we treat it, by treating what we believe is the cause of the syrinx, the blockage of fluid flowing outside the spinal cord. Yes. I simply want to say thank you for doing this uh, program tonight. And it's definitely true that the genetic um, factor and the heredity, you have to know your family history. It turns out for me, my grandmother, who is now 94, actually had decompression surgery over 60 years ago because she too had a chelary malformation. I had one. I had the surgery um, March of Doing so much better. It's like night and day. But um, my question would be: Is there an association between, like, after 
association to my rheumatoid arthritis, bursitis, or joint pain after that surgery? No, generally not. Not, not to our knowledge. Yes. Did I notice in one of your slides, did you have mention of your autism in one of your slides? In autism? No, I, I use that as an example. I know that there are some um, studies going on that are connecting Chiari and autism, but I use it as an example. I, I think it was in um, the beginning slides, Dorothy's slides, that just indicated that that's one of the th research interests to see if there's an association between the two. Again, autism is a very complex disorder, just like Chiari, that's going to likely have multiple causes and not just one single cause. Uh, I believe, Dorothy, that was on, on one of your slides. Uh, there has been a hypothesis, which really remains just a hypothesis, that, uh, that perhaps some small percentage of, of children with autism might have some sensory motor problems. And, and people who study autism, which is extremely complex, one of the, thing, one of the findings is that some children have sensory motor uh, uh, processing uh, issues and difficulties. And the question is, could a, a tightness here uh, at the top of the spinal cord cause that sort of processing problem. And so there's a, a question and, and uh, investigations uh, that are being considered to look for that sort of problem, uh, sensory motor problems in kids with autism, and see if a, a tightness might exist here. But it is totally just a, a question and a hypothesis at this time. Yes? Uh, is, a, is a disorder or the malformation been linked to other disorders? I just remembered to repeat the question after, after all these questions. <laughs> now I forgot the question. You know, uh, is Chiari related to any, any autoimmune disorders? Uh, that, uh, and uh, no, not, not to my knowledge. It's, it's not linked with any uh, rheumatological disorder or autoimmune. Is that not that I know of? Sure. Uh, what, so the question is, what other related disorders uh, are involved? Often these are disorders, many of them congenital, which involve abnormalities of the spine and, and the cranium. There's disorders of, of the skull shape uh, and syndromes with, with uh, misshapen heads, essentially, in which you can have tight, tight uh, uh, areas back here that are called posterior fossa in the back, and that can be associated with Chiari. Uh, spina bifida, or myelomeningocele, is also associated with a Chiari, and we should mention that's a different kind of Chiari. It's called Chiari 2, as opposed to much of what we're talking about here has been Chiari 1. So you do hear about uh, the association of Chiari malformation and syrinx with a spina bifida and myelomeningocele, and that's probably the, the strongest association with another major disorder. I think you bring up a very important area that we haven't really discussed much. We've talked about the origin of Chiari, the diagnosis, the importance of diagnosis of Chiari, and then surgical treatment as if, and, and, and thankfully it, it, very do, it, it does help uh, in many cases. However, uh, we also know that in Chiari malformation there are, you know, there are patients that we have to do again. There's many patients that have residual symptoms. And the concern, of course, is, is once some injury is 
once an injury occurs, either the spinal cord or the, or the brain, it doesn't always uh, repair uh, itself. And the brain is, is not always so forgiving. Uh, a syrinx is something that concerns us a great deal because, as I mentioned, the spinal cord is very sensitive. And if you expand fluid inside the spinal cord, it stretches a lot of vital fibers. Uh, even if the syrinx does come down, uh, those fibers may not work uh, normally. And so uh, there, it, this becomes a chronic neurological problem. And quite honestly, there's a whole field of, of uh, neurological rehab medicine which tries to deal with weaknesses, numbnesses, uh, what we call uh, rigidity or spasticity, which can occur uh, uh, after a spinal cord injury or, or a brain injury. And it's, it can be very different, have different patterns in, in, in patients with syringomyelia or Chiari, so it's a very individual challenge. But it reflects just the, the general challenge of neurological rehabilitation chronically. It's kind of a, it's, it's in a very important topic, and I think, think it's something that uh, the Chiari Foundation uh, can also address. Uh, this is a chronic problem and, and a chronic disease, even after what we would consider successful surgery. Yes? Are there any no known kinds of what? I'm sorry? Oh, I see. Uh, well, we, we had mentioned uh, the rare instance of a sort of a drop attack and passing out. Uh, uh, Chiari can be somewhat episodic, very often it's, it's a chronic problem, but it can be made a lot worse by certain maneuvers, such as uh, I've had patients who after painting the ceiling have a severe attack of their pain and symptoms. Uh, coughing and sneezing can cause severe headaches, so there are episodes, uh, and I, I'm sure uh, people in the audience knows this, knows this uh, better than I do, but you, you can have ups and downs and, if you will, attacks of symptoms that can be based on your activity. Sometimes they're based on things we don't understand. But, uh, so you can have uh, attacks, if you will, or exacerbations. Ah, go here. What are the common treatments other than surgery? This uh, is primarily, as we understand it right now, a mechanical disorder. So uh, uh, without having too much of a, I hope, a, a, a a surgical bias, uh, a physical decompression is, has been the mainstay of, of treatment. The other one has been observation. Uh, there's, no, there's no medicine that we know of besides treating symptoms, besides treating the symptoms of a headache, for example, uh, that, uh, that can treat the, the carry malformation. Yeah, uh, because this is a very complex area that can compress this, the spinal cord, bottom of the brain stem, and all the cranial nerves, we are, we are looking for very subtle changes in strength, sensation, uh, from the history we ask about, you know, feelings of tingling or, or, or sensitivities. In the uh, case of, of the syringomyelia, uh, there's a very, uh, I guess, peculiar pattern, if you will, of, of sensory loss. We have had patients who, if, if you just ask them if they can feel their fingers, they, they feel their fingers just fine. And, and in a casual exam of sensation, they may have normal sensation. However, if you specifically test if they can feel pain, if you touch the pin and, and make it what would be more painful, they may not feel that pain. Or they can't really differentiate well hot and cold. The fibers which control or that transmit the information about hot and cold and pain across the middle of the spinal cord, and they are the most uh, vulnerable to an expanding spinal cord. So here you have a very specific kind of loss, which is often pretty subtle. And, and I remember one patient, uh, the, the, the resident went in and did the exam, came out and said the sensation was fine, and I walked in, and everything, again, same sort of history, but I noticed that there were burns in several places on, on his fingers. I said, what are those marks? Oh, yeah, they're burns. Sometimes, when I smoke, sometimes I forget about it and, and uh, the cigarette burns down and I burn my fingers. Well, here's a person who is not feeling temperature and pain the way he should. Uh, and uh, he didn't even realize at the time that it was a sensory issue. So there are uh, patterns like that, but you're really looking for, for changes in sensory or motor function that can be pretty subtle. 
Yes. Uh, the surgery is in, in, a, in a very sensitive area, as you can imagine. It's the junction of your head and your neck. Everything that your head does to control your body, including control of respiration, is in that area. So it's, a, it's an area which is not very forgiving uh, to any, any uh, compression or any bleed that might compress or cause, uh, in the sense, a stroke in that area. So it's not a very forgiving area, and for that reason, uh, it is, uh, it is a very critical area to operate in because the stakes are, are just as high as they can be. Uh, given that, I will say that uh, the opening of this area is something that is very familiar to, to especially pediatric neurosurgeons, but, but to most all surgeons who, are, who, who work on the head itself uh, because it is the approach to other neurosurgical procedures to get into that area of the brain. Luckily, in the case of Chiari, we often aren't going into the brain. We're just opening up and exposing and decompressing, but we're not really going inside. And so in that sense, it is not as invasive an operation as, for example, a brain tumor, thankfully. But still, it's in a very critical area uh, where, where anything like a bleed or a compression could cause a deficit. Yes, uh, this I think is an example of why we should be good to our students, I think. Because it was actually, uh, Chiari first described the different types of, of malformation, and uh, Arnold then described a, a, a couple of cases uh, of Chiari, I think it was associated with the Chiari II malformation, and it was his students in, in writing the paper that, that put the term in for Arnold Chiari, they, they put his name uh, in, in front of Chiari. And uh, historically, uh, the name has stuck to some extent, but many people recognize that it was really Chiari more than Arnold uh, that was involved with the, with the discovery. So uh, you're, you're, you're permitted to use either term, but. Uh, so it's still the same thing. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. Yes? That's that general umbrella of like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, for example, or like Dr. Luciano alluded to earlier, um, certain rare connective tissue disorders that involve malformations of the skull. They're extremely rare. They're easy to diagnose. This would not um, be someone, at least that I can tell in this audience, would have. So again, disorders in the, in the matrix that makes up our bones, our skin, um, there could be something there genetically determined that causes that. For the known syndromes, that's rare, and you would know that. But the big one is, is Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, specifically the hypermobile type. Well, thank you very much. I really, we really appreciate it. A lot of good information, and again, you can go back and reference this on the web. We should have it up there in the next few weeks. I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, again, please contact Dorothy or I. We want to know how we as a national organization can help you, and we'd love for you to join us at our events and functions to help us continue to raise awareness and much-needed funds for research. Be safe driving home, and thank you. <laughs>